We're in Matthew chapter 8 today. We're going to be looking at Jesus delivering two men of their demon possession. Matthew chapter 8, 28 through 34. We'll find as you study the Bible that throughout the Lord's ministry, he was constantly casting out demons. And he was doing that by the Spirit of God. We have one passage here that says, Matthew uh, 12, 28, it says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's Matthew 12, 28. There's another passage. You don't need to turn there. It says almost the same thing in Luke chapter eleven twenty. 20. He says, If I cast out demons by the finger of God. So one place he says the Spirit of God, and there in Luke he calls it the finger of God. But notice he says, I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. It takes the Spirit of God to cast out demons. And then, of course, we have Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that we read a few weeks ago. We'll read it again today. Acts 10, 38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. See how he's anointed with the Holy Spirit. And with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him and so jesus is in the business of delivering people from the powers of darkness and if you're a christian here today whether you know it or not you have been delivered from the powers of darkness according to colossians chapter 1 verse 13 it says he delivered us from the powers of darkness and translated us or conveyed us into the kingdom of his dear son I just want to mention this when it comes. I'm not going to talk a lot about demon possession today and these different things, but I do want to emphasize at the onset that it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to cast out demons. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to deal with the powers of darkness. And a lot of times you will read books and hear all kinds of stories what people did to get rid of de devils and demons and evil spirits. And um, I'm just going to stick close to the Bible on this issue. Uh, even in the name of Jesus. Somebody says, well, you cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Jesus said you would. He said, you'll, in my name, you'll cast out demons. But when you study the book of Acts, you'll always find when Paul, for an example, there's two instances of him casting out demons. And if you study that out, you'll always see in those examples that the Holy Spirit was always present right. and in power. And... Um, so that's why you see a lot of Christians saying, come out of them in the name of Jesus, and you hear all of this, and nothing ever happens. It's because it takes the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll just mention a couple of things to you, just on the onset here, because I don't want to go into this any further, but I want to address a few things. I cast out, what, uh, in my lifetime, 40-some years as a Christian, two demons. That's all I've ever cast out. That's all the Holy Spirit ever enabled me to cast out. Cast out a spirit of a woman when the Lord said tell that unclean spirit to come out of her. I mean, I heard those words as, as clear as I ever heard anything in my whole life, and the power and the presence of God came on me. I didn't raise my voice or anything. I just said, come out of her, you unclean spirit. The power of God picked that lady up, threw her backwards on the floor. She bursted in tears and crying. And I found out later what had happened is that she uh, evidently was being molested uh, by a man, uh, in, I think in her past, and she was under the torment of the demon that was involved in that issue. And she was totally set free. I didn't understand that until weeks and months later when I talked to the Lord about it because I thought that it was a completely different issue. And he showed me what, what it was. I won't go into detail. But then there was another lady. This lady here was also, she was uh, molested by her grandpa. And I never knew what was about to happen. I'm just ministering to people. All of a sudden, the power of God came on me again. Just all totally surprised by it. Didn't know what was going to happen to me. And I said, come out of her in the name of Jesus. That's all I said. See how the power of God was present in using the name of Jesus? That woman was totally, completely set free. She told me, she wrote me a letter. And she said every time she went out in the parking lots and, and set, uh, set groceries on her on her. Uh, on her car, you know, to unlock the door, she'd look over the car lid and there would be a, 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 a face of her grandpa. It was really the demon taking on that image of the grandpa. And uh, that doesn't mean that everyone that was ever molested has a demon. Okay? It doesn't mean that. So you've got to be real careful if you start reading books. Like I told you before, there's a couple areas that Christians really get 
uh, messed up in. They begin to emphasize demons and demonology. They'll get, they'll get always get messed up in that all the time. Never is there an exception. Always they'll get messed up. The other one is end times. Like I told Loris today, there's three real uh, solid views of end times. Out of those three views, there's seven other views that are really close to that. And out of those seven views, there's 12 views. And these are all by wonderful Christian people. And so you never want to get upset because somebody takes a different view than you take when it comes to end times. Never want to do that. A sign of a mature Christian is, is that somebody can meet another Christian and they have opposing views and they love each other as much as they ever have, even though their views on certain things are opposed to one another. In other words, the other Christian means far more to you than their view does. But as soon as you make a particular view, the big issue, you're, you haven't grown much as a Christian. You may think you have because of knowledge. Everybody thinks they've grown a lot because they know so much. But remember what Paul said about knowledge. It puffs you up. Doesn't mean you've grown much at all. Just because you can talk a lot of things and say a lot of things doesn't mean you've grown at all. There's a lot of commentators and what have you that talk about all kinds of things. All, but it doesn't mean they have much of a relationship with the Lord. So always remember that, okay? So now we're going to look at this, Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 through 34. Now, there, this is also the same, the same message is in Mark chapter 5, 1 through 20, and it's in Luke chapter 8, 26 through 30. Mark has seven verses on it. Or excuse me, Matthew has seven verses, Mark has 20 verses, and Luke has 14 verses. So I'm going to take Mark, who has 20 verses, and he has a whole lot more to say than Matthew. Now, because we're in Matthew, I will quote a few things from Matthew. I'm in Matthew right now. And so I'll read in verse 28. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Ger Gerardines, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no one was able to pass by that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them there was a herd of swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So they, when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled and went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Now, I read Matthew chapter 28-ish story on this. So you heard the whole thing, seven verses. But now let's take it apart, beginning with Mark chapter 4, verse 35. The reason I go to Mark 4, 35 is because this is where the story actually begins. It's all in Mark 5. But do you remember last week when they got into the boat and they went to the other side, a great storm came up? So look at it, Mark 5, uh, 4, 35. It says, On the same day, when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Verse 39 says, And he rose, arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And whether you know it or not, that was a, quite a miracle. Because you can have the wind blown like crazy, and you can have eight-foot waves. If the wind stops immediately, those waves just don't stop immediately. But here, the waves just stopped. Quite a miracle. And um, then you also notice in that uh, passage, it says that he rebuked the wind. See that? He rebuked the wind. Now, some people think that perhaps... And you, you might start thinking this way as we go into this further, that maybe the powers of darkness had something to do with that storm, that they caused it. In other words, it wasn't just a natural thing. Last week when we looked at this, we looked at Job and how Job 
the, and the first time the devil came against him and his family, he caused a windstorm to come and blow down his house. Remember that? So when, evidently, when God gives the devil permission to do something, he can do some unthinkable things. So perhaps, we'll just use the word perhaps, we can suggest that maybe the powers of darkness were involved with this. Some people try to emphasize it even stronger by saying, you know, every wind of doctrine, you know, so they use the word wind, and devils are involved with false doctrines, and so they try to say the devil was involved here. I, not know, I don't know if he was or not, but I do not doubt that he was. And so he goes on to say, and uh, he said, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now you come into Mark 5, where this story is at. Mark 5, 1 through 2 says, And then they came to the other side of the sea. Remember Jesus said, We're going to the other side. So now they're at the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, this is uh, interesting, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now when you read this story out of three Gospels, they're dwelling in the wilderness. Where in the wilderness are they always dwelling? We don't know. But as soon as the boat touches the shoreline, immediately the demons are, the demon-possessed man, the demons that are in him, have put him in that position so they can immediately meet up with Jesus. Immediately there they met him. Out of the tombs a man. Now here it says a man. Matthew says two men. Luke says a certain man from the city. Here it says, a man with an unclean spirit. Luke says, uh, a certain man from the city who had demons a long time. And they approached Jesus. And the amazing thing is, and this ought to be true about all Christians, Jesus showed absolutely no fear, no worry, no anxiety, no concern over these demons. They did not bother him one bit. Sometimes when people talk about demons and they talk about haunted houses and all these different things, they get all scared. There's nothing to be scared about a demon. Demons, if you're scared of demons, you're believing in um, the stories of haunted houses and, and spooks. Demons cannot hurt a Christian. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And here's an interesting thought. In all three of these stories, the disciples are with Jesus. They got out of the boat with them. But nothing said about them. Now, we heard about those disciples being afraid of the storm, but they're not afraid of this demon. Some Christians talk about demons like they're so scared of them. You're not to be afraid of a demon. They're not, to, they're not going to hurt you. They never hurt Jesus. They didn't even attempt to hurt Jesus. They didn't even attempt to hurt the disciples. Demons, for the most part, have big mouths. And if you listen to them, you might allow yourself to get scared and become fearful, but you're not to listen to them. You're supposed to be listening to the Lord and listening to his holy word. I can tell you a bunch of stories right now, but I think I'll withhold my story so I can stay into the context. But <laughs> I guess I will tell you this one. Lester Summerall. Lester Summerall was quite a preacher. And um, he said he was asleep one night in a strange place, and the bed picked up and moved across the room. Lester Summerall just said, put it back, and rolled over and went back to sleep. Next morning, the bed was right back. Wasn't scared of the demon. Demons try to get you scared of them because they operate in the realm of fear. If, in the realm of fear, if they can bring you into the realm of fear, well, they brought you out of the realm of faith and the realm of trust and the realm of confidence in God. And that's why uh, Christians are not afraid of demons because their faith and their confidence is resting in God. That's why Jesus wasn't afraid on the storm. His confidence was in God. That's why he told his disciples, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Because their confidence wasn't in God. Remember how we talked about that? And this is part of growing as a Christian. Maybe as an early days Christian, you'd be scared of a demon, but by now you should not be scared of them at all because you should have grown in your fellowship and your relationship with the Lord that you're always counting on him for all things. Everything in prayer, all the time, because you trust him. This demon, by the way, in verse 2 and 4, uh, showed great strength. Immediately there met him out of the tomb a man with an unclean spirit, 
who had his dwelling among the tombs, who no one could bind, not even with chains. Luke 8.29 says he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. Verse 4 of Mark 5 says, And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken to pieces, neither could anyone tame him. So he was a scary individual. All the people of the town were scared of him. But the people of the town, as you read the story, they had nothing to do with God. We that have something to do with God, we are his children. We are not to be scared of devils and demons and evil spirits. We are out of their realm. We've been delivered from the authority of darkness. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. And the Bible teaches us to resist the devil and he'll flee. And that passage says he'll flee means he'll flee from terror just by you resisting him. Just by you taking your position in Christ. He'll flee from you. The Bible says that believers will cast out demons. In other words, they've been put in a position of authority through the Lord Jesus Christ to resist demons and when led by the Spirit of God to cast them out. Demons don't want to deal with true Christians that understand the Bible. They'll, they'll deal with confused Christians that don't understand the Bible. And they'll try to bring them into that realm of doubt and unbelief and fear. And if they can do that, then they can oppress that Christian with a lot of, a lot of difficulties. Let's just say it that way. So this demon in this man demonstrated strength through the man. He pulled apart his chains and shackles, and, but he had no strength whatsoever of his greater bondage, which was sin, in that demon possession. I don't know about you, but I don't care if I can break chains and shackles. I want to be broken from the greater sh chain and shackle of sin. How about you? Amen. Verse 5 says, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. He was tormented day and night in despair and hopelessness. He cried out continually, cutting himself. There was no one that could help him. But soon we're going to read verse 19. And when we read verse 19, we're going to hear the Lord Jesus say to him, Go to home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion upon you. Always remember, no matter how dark it looks, because you're in Christ and you belong to God, there's always hope. There's, there, you're, you will never live in a place, no matter what the circumstances seem like, where that place can be genuine despair and hopelessness. Because you're with God. And remember that. Now I want to add something here about this story. This story of this man is a perfect picture of what God has done for you and me in Christ Jesus. In the book of Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 through 7, the Bible says in the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman and born under the law. Jesus went to the other side. He left heaven and came to the earth. He stepped on our earth where you and I are. And now we can immediately meet him. And we'll meet him with power and grace and mercy. Verse 5 of Galatians 4 says, He came, uh, he, he came to redeem those who were under the law. And when you read that phrase, redeemed under the law, it means redeemed under, to be redeemed from those under the condemnation of the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons, and because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Where this fellow was crying all night long and cutting himself with stones, we can cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father. What that actually means is that there's a constant, continual cry in your heart, whether you're verbalizing or not, there's a cry in your heart that says, Abba, Father. God is my Father. Also, this story represents us in the context of what we read in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 2 through 5 says, In which you also, want to co you once also walked according to the course of this world. Just like this man that was possessed by demons did. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So if an unsaved person may not be possessed by a demon, but he has demons at work in his life, guiding and directing him. 
Verse 3 says, Among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That's one thing that their spirit that's at work in the sons of disobedience will drive them to do is to fulfill the lust of their flesh and the desires of their flesh and of their mind. In other words, everybody, Christian and non-Christian, have sinful flesh to deal with, okay? But demons, in, in an un, I said that wrong. A spirit, the, the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience, that's their uh, routine of work is to always be prompting people, motivating people to walk after their flesh. And you need to realize that. But though that's all true, verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, wherewith he loved us, just like Jesus had compassion, God had compassion on this man, God had compassion on all of us because of his great love for us, which he loved us, even when we are dead in trespasses and sins, he made us alive with Christ. By grace we are saved. He also tells us in Ephesians 2, further down the page, in verses 11 through 13, I won't read all of it, but the first verse, verse 11 says, Therefore remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh. Go down now to verse 12. At that time you were without Christ. So when we were Gentiles in the flesh, we were without Christ. And it goes on to say, at the end of verse 12, having no hope and without God in this world. We're so much like that demon-possessed man, weren't we? But now in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So I can identify with this demon-possessed man. I can identify with his bondage to a degree, and I can, always, I can also uh, identify with the liberty and the freedom that he received. In Romans 6, 17 through 18, it says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, though that was once true about you, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered or to which you were poured into. And having been set free from sin, you became a slave of righteousness. And that's what really happened to this man. He was a slave of sin. He was actually a slave to demons that possessed him. But now he's a slave of righteousness just like you. And I gave you this earlier. It says in Colossians 1, verse 12, it says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He made us qualified through the blood of Christ is how he did that. And he delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. We're no longer in the kingdom of darkness. This man that was possessed by these demons was in the kingdom of darkness. You and I are not in the kingdom of darkness. You and I are in the kingdom of the son of his love. In whom, the son of his love, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now we return back to Mark chapter 5. We look at verse 6 through 8. It says, when, Jesus saw, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of God, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Look at how he's pleading not to be tormented. Evidently, he knows and other passages say, have you come to torment us before the time? They know that there's a time coming at the end. On Judgment Day, when these demons are going to be tormented day and night, as the scripture says. Verse 8 says, for he said to him, come out of him. Come out of the man, unclean spirit. The demon that controlled this man had absolutely no concern for the torment that he was afflicting upon this man. He was concerned of the torm only of the torment that he, that, that he knew was awaiting for him. Isn't that amazing? He didn't care how much he, he tormented you. He just didn't want Jesus tormenting him. A selfish demon. I think all demons are selfish. Of course, people are selfish too, aren't they? I told somebody one day, I said, I don't know if these demons can hold a candle to some people. Verse 9 through 13, then he asked him, 
Jesus is speaking here. What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him. All the demons begged him. First the legion begged him earnestly. Now all the demons are begging him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. Evidently, these demons do not want to lose their stronghold in any region. They want their evil work to go on unhindered. And you have to remember that in your life, even as a Christian, that the Bible says we wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. They don't like the idea that you got delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. They still want to try to bring suggestions to your mind, to try to bring you into an oppression, not a possession, but an oppression, oppressing you with thoughts. We'll talk about that in a moment. They were fine in dwelling in this land. If they could stay there, they would dwell in the pigs. Verse 13 says, and at once Jesus gave them permission. Now the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine, and there was about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. The effect of these demons on these pigs was something else. The pigs could not withstand this activity the effect of this activity of demons within them. And they did something abnormal that they would normally never do. They ran down the mountain into the sea and drowned themselves. Just like the man did things that were, not, that were abnormal, the pigs did something abnormal. Demons, when they begin to strongly influence a, a, an individual, strongly oppress an individual, will move that person to do things that are abnormal. Now notice how the legion and the other demons as well begged him not to be sent out of the country. And then also notice the phrase, Jesus gave them permission. What does both of these things teach? It teaches us that the demons can't do anything without God's permission, even when it comes to entering pigs, the torment. Now I want you to hear that real good. Demons just can't do whatever they want to do. God restrains their evil intentions. Demons cannot do whatever they like because the Lord reigns. And God does not permit demons to take possession of Christians. Now, I know there was a guy on the radio and he was casting devils and demons out of Christians all the time. But let me just tell you a story that you got to hear. When I was a young little baby Christian, we had this lady that always came to our meetings. And every meeting, somebody had to cast the de demons out of her. And this went on and on and on, and we always wondered why. I thought those demons were cast out. I wondered, you know, why did they always come back in again? So I went to this one meeting, and she, she would stand up to call for prayer. They, she came up for prayer. As soon as the minister stood in front of her, she just started acting up and screeching and doing all kinds of things, throwing her arms around, what have you. And the preacher just stood there and looked at her, and she just let, let her screech and crawl and scream, whatever she wanted to do. And then when she got all done... The preacher had some wisdom given to him by God. And the preacher said, that was just all you, wasn't it? That was no demon. That was just you. She broke down and started crying. She says, yes, it was. She was looking for attention. I'm here to tell you, Christians are always looking for attention, especially the ones that are immature. And she was very immature, always looking for attention. She had all the Christians talking about her, everybody praying for her. And all she was doing was making the whole thing up. So, I just, as your pastor, I just want to encourage you, don't get lost into the teachings of demonology because you'll get more messed up than a flock of geese in a snowstorm. God does not permit demons to take possession of Christians, but he may allow them to test and try their faith. Now, we have Luke chapter 22, verse 31, where the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may, 
get the word may, that he may sift you as wheat. So he's asking that he may do something. He's just not just going to jump out there and do it. Somebody says, you open the door to the devil. Somebody says, well, Peter, open the door to the devil. Somebody said, told me about Dave and Julie one time, their house caught in fire. Says, they must have opened the door to the devil, their house caught in fire. A lot of nonsense. Keep out of everybody else's business. Mind your own business. You've got enough business to take care of yourself. And, uh, but I want you to notice right here that they ask for permission. Satan asks for permission. I mean, that's the king demon, right? That's the king devil, the devil himself. Asks for permission to sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith should not, say, uh, not fail. So evidently, permission was given that Jesus supported him by praying for his faith. And I want you to know Jesus is supporting you. The Holy Ghost is supporting you all the time. Remember Job, Job chapter 1, verse 12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay your hand on his person. Evidently he sought to touch Job. Jesus, uh, the Lord God gave him uh, permission to do so, but only allowed him to go so far. The devil can't do whatever he wants to do. In Job 2, 6, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Now notice, when this story took place, nothing happened to Job about him losing his mind, going into the wilderness, screaming and crying and carrying on and, and cutting himself with stones. What happened is he lost his family, and he got very sick. So that's what you call oppression. They came and was allowed by the Lord. For whatever reason, no one really knows for sure. We can come up with a thousand reasons, I guess. But I'm going to stay out of those weeds because there's no sense going into that, those weeds. You don't know. All we know is the Lord allowed it, but we also know the Lord controlled what he allowed. And then we come back to Mark chapter 5, and we go to verses 14 through 17. Mark chapter 5, verses 14 through 17, it says, So then, so those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus, and they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. See, they were afraid. Now, it goes on to say, in verse 16, And those who saw it told them how it had happened to him, who had, the demon, who, had, who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Luke 8, 37 says, And the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gerardines came and asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. Now this great fear that they were seized with is referring to the fear of God. In Acts 5.11, it says, So great fear fell upon all the church who heard these things. And that was the whole story of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember how they dropped dead for lying? Right. And great fear came upon them. Great fear came upon this town. I went to a house one time, and I was preaching the gospel to this lady that used to be a nun. This, she was already saved, but she liked it when I came over there and preached to her. She was married to an older fella that was a farmer, retired farmer, I'm not going to tell you what area because I don't want you to figure out who he is. But he's a retired fire, a farmer, kind of an older guy. And he was mad at me because when I was talking to his wife, who used to be a nun, I was talking to her and I said, well, you need Jesus Christ for salvation. There's nothing can save you. The church can't save you. Your sacraments can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. And she's agreeing with me and he's disagreeing with me. He said, I don't like that because if that's true, that means my wife that died is now in hell. And I says, I don't know if your wife didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, evidently, she must have gave evidence to him that she never did. So after a long time, years went by, and I went out there knocking on the door. His son was there. I said, I'd like to come on in and talk to so-and-so. As soon as he heard, Dad, so-and-so, the preacher's here, he just looked at his boy, who? Yelled my name out. Get him out of here. <laughs> 
I don't want him around my here. Get him out of my property. I don't want him around. He just yelled and screamed and carried on like he was crazy. That man was afraid. How many times as Christians you have tried to talk to somebody and right away they want to get away from you. They want to skirt away from you. It's that sometimes a Christian, the Lord, will, you won't even know it, but there's a presence of the Holy Spirit that emulates from you. And the people that are in darkness, that love darkness, that don't want nothing to do with hearing the gospel, they get afraid. And I really believe this is what happened there. There's the Lord Jesus anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of that power was demonstrated with that man being totally, completely delivered in his right mind. And you would think that they would be happy about it, right? They were scared of this guy for a while. They had somebody guarding him. They had him shackled and chained. They once knew him because he once lived in that city. Now they moved him out to the tombs. And there's a lot I can say about this, about the suspicion that went on. Some people say that the people that day thought that he was possessed by the people that were in those tombs. And this is their suspicions or what do you call that superstition? So you would think that they would have loved for Jesus to be there. But the townspeople were were once afraid of the demon-possessed man when no one could tame him, no one could control him, not with chains or shackles, but now that he's clothed and in his right mind, they're afraid of him. They're afraid of Jesus who delivered him. It seems that they would rather have a demon-possessed man running around, screaming and hollering and cutting himself than the Savior sent from God that would change their life. And you need to realize this. You're going to meet up with people that they got their own way they want to believe about things and they don't want to hear the gospel and they'll be afraid of you. And sometimes in their being afraid of you, they could even strike out and try to hit you out of their fear. Verse 15 says, clothed in his right mind. 2 Timothy 2.17 talks about this. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, timidity, but a power and love and a sound mind. That word sound mind also can be translated self-discipline, self-control, sound judgment, and wise discretion. In other words, God has given us a spirit of a sound mind that enables us to have self-discipline, self-control, and sound judgment, and wise discretion. That's the Holy Spirit that's dwelling on the inside of you. Like I said earlier, the Bible says we can resist the devil and he'll flee from us. The Bible says that we can cast out demons. The Bible teaches us that the believer is no longer in the powers of darkness. He's in the kingdom of God. But you have to remember something. I'm going to take you a little longer today because I got to this point. I feel like everybody has to hear this. So bear with me for five minutes. We have to realize that not all the thoughts that come to our mind are demonic but they originate with the flesh. You have, to, you have to understand that, everybody. Not all of them. When the powers of darkness are at work against the human mind, they suggest thoughts to our mind that cause, watch this now, they cause anxiety, doubt, fear, jealousy, hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness, despair, and hopelessness. In this story, we see how the powers of darkness attempted to control people, which always begins with the mind. But you can't not say all of these things that come to your mind are always the demons doing this. Jesus taught us in Matthew 5, 29, that if your right eye causes you to sin, to pluck it out. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish then your whole body is cast into hell. Here the eye refers to the mind. The flesh suggests sinful thoughts as we see in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, it says, For from within, out of the heart, proceed evil thoughts. See, it's not proceeding from demons here, is it? It's proceeding from the heart. This is talking about the flesh. He lists all kinds of thoughts, thoughts of adultery, thoughts of fornication, thoughts of murder, thoughts of thefts, thoughts of covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within. They defile the man. So you need to realize that there's thoughts that come from without 
Just out of nowhere, here comes a thought. Then there's thoughts and things that come up, rise up out of your flesh. So you've got to remember, not all of this stuff is demonic. Some of it's fleshly. You have to remember that. And uh, the, the way you know the difference is because when thoughts come from demons, they're very oppressive. They want to control. That's how you can always tell. The other thoughts that come up, they just kind of spring up. and You've been used to it your whole life. They've been always popping up. And the Bible tells you that as a Christian, you are to not obey the lust of the flesh. See, you have one session, uh, in the, section in the Bible says, obey not the lust of the flesh. You go another place in the Bible says, resist the devil. So when the devil brings all this oppressiveness against you, and I tell you what, it's always so associated with a sense of hopelessness and a sense of despair, a sense of giving up. Because he's a pusher. He's a driver. Where well, the lust of the flesh want to lead you uh, to go the course of this world, to lead you to be like others. That's the best way I know how to uh, handle it. And so when I have thoughts coming against me and they're very oppressive and they want to make me quit, well, see, right away I know that's the powers of darkness because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against principality or powers, but rules of the darkness of this world. And then he tells you to put on the whole armor of God and having done all to stand, stand therefore. So there's a standing, it's a resisting. Okay? In my life in ministry... I'm constantly having demonic powers come against my mind all the time, and they always want me to quit. Constantly. Quit, 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 quit. So all they want me to do is quit. And I have to resist them. None of that comes up out of my heart. None of that comes up out of my heart. I have no quit inside me. It all comes from the outside trying to oppress me. That's what it tries to do. So if you ever in your life feel like you're being oppressed, notice this man, he was controlled. He was pushed, wasn't he? He was pushed out into the wilderness. He was pushed over into the tombs. He was pushed to cut himself. You're being pushed. You're trying to be, be controlled. Something seems bigger than you, overwhelming than you. That's always demonic powers. And you can resist it. The Bible says in 1 Peter, your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast fast in the faith. So the way you resist him... I resist I, says, I take my position in Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm in Christ Jesus. I am that new creation. I belong to God. God is my Father. Jesus is my Lord. The Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of me. I'll not go this way. I will not quit. I refuse to quit. I'm going to serve God. I resist the devil. I, st I stand on that, and it leaves me. But the devil likes to poke his nose into your face. When you're tired, you're wore out. He's a bully. Bullies, you know what a bully is, don't you? A bully tries to come on somebody in a weak position and push him. Now, the lust of the flesh have been with you since you were a child. And they're always something trying to seduce you and to lead you another way. Now, as we've seen in Ephesians chapter 2, that the prince that works in the children of, of disobedience, they try to make people walk according to the course of this world to fulfill those desires of the flesh. So there can always be demonic activity trying to seduce you that way, trying to make you go the way of the flesh. But you have two things to resist. You have to resist the devil. You have to do all, uh, put on the whole armor of God, which we'll talk about at another time, and stand against him. Having done all to stand, you stand. Standing is talking about resisting. Right? Falling down is giving in. You're not resisting anymore. You fell down. You give up. I'm here to tell you that I've had give up written on my face, on my head, smile in the mirror, had it in my mouth, I had it in my hands, all over me. Give up. Give up. Quit. 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 Very oppressive. Very pushy. Very shovy. Big bully. Constantly. And what happens when the devil comes against you with these kind of thoughts those thoughts seem so reasonable. It gives you every reason why you should quit. Every reason why. He'll do this to marriages. He'll do this to friendships. 
He'll do this with ministry and service to the Lord. He always wants you to quit. Anything that's God-honoring, he'll want you to quit. Anything that's fleshly will come up out of your, come up. But when that comes up, no, I'm not, no, I'm not going to go there. That's not me. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I don't walk in the flesh. I resist and do not obey the lust of the flesh. So I'm going to quit a lot of things here. I just want to finish it up by saying in verse 18, it says, He got in the boat, and he who had the demon-possessed man begged him that he might be with him. This is what everyone does when they're in their right mind. What do they want to do? They want to beg to be with Jesus. They want to be with Jesus. When you read the story, it says Jesus was immediately met with a man, met a man with a demon. A man with a demon. Now the demon's gone, and this man wants to be with Jesus. And that's, he's in his right mind. Verse 19 says, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. It's not that Jesus didn't want him to follow him, but he wanted Jesus wanted him to serve him by telling others what the Lord did for him. And as soon as the Lord restores one of us, he wants us to do the, the same thing. He wants us to go tell others. Verse 20 says, And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. And he was once, he was once out of his mind, chained, shackled, homeless, driven into the wilderness to live among the tombs. But now all things have become new. And, his and that same testimony is ours in Christ Jesus. As new creations, all things have become new. We all were like him. We were shackled and chained to our sin. We were without God and without hope in this world, but he set us free, and now we're with him. He's with us, and our homes have become a place of prayer and worship, and our life has become a life of love and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? So don't go home today. Don't be afraid of demons. Just notice if you know, in your life, if anything comes against you, oppressive, driving, pushy, shovey, trying to have control. It'll never take control, but it'll try to push you. You're to resist that, okay? Then fleshly, seducing things that rise up within you, you're not to obey those. You've died to sin. You're alive with Christ. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're free from sin. And you're free to live a righteous life. God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. His spirit in you will help you make wise decisions. He'll help you practice self-control. And life can be what God wants it to be for you. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hands to heaven and we thank you that we heard the truth from God's word about these issues. Lord, help all of us that we don't go into extremes and move off into foolishness after hearing a message like this. Help us to stay in the middle of the road. Help us to stay balanced. Help us to walk in the authority of the Word of God. Help us to walk in truth. Help us to put to practice the Word of God. Help us to grow and mature as Christians. Father, watch over us and protect us and keep us. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. I love you.